seems like a long time ago when we talked about a case, and I started out by saying that on the surface, that case looked pretty simple and straightforward. But as we got into the discussion, uh, it became clear that it wasn't quite as simple and straightforward uh, as it first appeared. There were a lot of uh, issues, even though the, the, the basics of the case were simple. I would have to say that this is the opposite at least in terms of simplicity. This is a very, this is complicated. Um, you know, we could spend the next hour and a half uh, talking about any one of a number of different dimensions uh, of this case, uh, the financing of the case, uh, how you structure a project like this, the role of development of finance institutions, the liability of the case. So we're gonna try and cover a lot of ground, but I, I will say at the outset that this is a, much more multi-dimensional uh, and complicated than what we're doing this morning. But we're still going to try and draw out some uh, lessons which I think um, are relevant uh, not only to the protagonists in the case, uh, but also, um, also uh, uh, to hopefully to some of you. What I'd like to do is, is very quickly go through some of this and then not so quickly the rest. I'm going to go, I just want to remind you of the timeline this because it's, it's forever. So I think we should know what that is. And that's not so unusual, by the way. Then we're, as you know, I like to start by talking a little bit about who are the, who are the principal stakeholders in this case. Who are, and there are many, many more involved, obviously, but we'll talk about the story. So that, that's the first layer of complexity, is when you talk about the stakeholders. If you were talking to somebody who did, had not read the case as thoroughly and was as expert as you were, how would you describe the project in simple terms. What are the project fundamentals? We've got to start there. How do we define this? What is this project about? Uh, what's the purpose? Who are the owners? How is it financed? You, you don't have to have the numbers, but you have to have a general overview of how you finance a project like this. And to do that, you probably should also, you may not have paid attention to this, but it's relevant and I, as I told you this morning, I, I used to work in the IFC, so I worked on a lot of projects like this, not necessarily like this, but projects. You develop a base case of what you expect is going to happen over a period of years. And that base case, of course, is based on a set of assumptions, based on the industry, the owners, and everything you happen to know. But everything is driven by that base case. Uh, whether the project is going to make it. So I, I just want you to be aware of that. We won't talk about it very much, but I do think we have to be able to describe what is this about and who's, who are the potential beneficiaries. Then, of course, I, I'd really like to spend a little bit of time on the World Bank and the IFC, particularly the World Bank. What was their, What is their role generally? I think that most of the people in this room know that, but we should remind ourselves about what this development finance institution does. Uh, and then more specifically, what's its role in this case, which is really interesting uh, and controversial. That's a hint. Uh, now, if you were working for the World Bank uh, as a staff member, like Brian was or like I was, uh, and when you develop a project, the final step is you go to the board, the board of directors of the bank, which the board of directors is comprised of representatives from all the member governments, and, and you present your case for why the directors, the board of directors, should vote yes or no for the project that you are advocating. So what we want to do is we want you to think about if you were demoted to a being in the World Bank from your other job, the job you have now, and you went to the World Bank and you were presenting before the, uh, you were presenting before the World Bank board of directors, how would you make the case? To the directors, the board, uh, the, the board of directors, vote yes for this project. What would you say, in summary, to support your advocacy for going forward with this project in 2000? Alternatively, we should look at why you might vote no. And as you can tell, if you've read the case, there are lots of reasons to vote no, as well as to vote yes for this. So let's look at both sides of this, and I'll ask you to, to, to look at this. Uh, the, 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 this particular project, all projects that are this big, this complex, there are critics. There are critics out there always for these types of projects. 
But in this particular case, there was a multiplicity of things. And so we should look at what they were saying and why they were saying it, and what your views are, and whether those criticisms um, had validity or not. And in 2000, at the time we did it, uh, and we should also look at some point at this very elaborate revenue management plan that the World Bank constructed as a way of monitoring the project. And finally, um, I will tell you what happened. But I'm going to—I I could probably spend half or three quarters of the next hour and 15 minutes giving you the conclusion and telling you what happened. And I'm not going to do that. It is, the, the what happened is very complex. It goes on for years. I'm not going to tell you what the what happened was, but it is complicated. We are going to give you some handouts at the end, but I will give you a brief summary of what happened, and, and then maybe we'll have some time to look at the um, at some of the lessons learned. So that's our, that's our agenda for this afternoon. Very, very quickly, and I'm only doing this because it is such a long timeline, and it is not always that unusual. This, this story starts way back in the early 1970s with, these, with the discovery of oil uh, by foreign oil companies, not by anybody locally. Uh, and they started to develop it uh, very, very slowly with lots of problems uh, for the first uh, almost a decade, and they finally suspended uh, exploration and production activities uh, in late, the late 1970s due to the Civil War that was raging in Chad. Tremendous civil unrest. They just couldn't work there. So after almost 10 years of some cost, they walked away. Or they didn't walk away, but they suspended the project. And this is before the bank got involved. Uh, and then there's a 15-year hiatus. That's quite a long time where not much happened. There was a lot of civil unrest and other problems in Chad. Uh, and in 1996, we have a new consortium of oil companies, a new MOU, Memo of Understanding, uh, and we begin to re-establish the possibility of this project. And then it took another three years uh, before they get to the project that we're discussing today. Uh, that was put together by this consortium of oil companies, the World Bank, the IFC, a bunch of other financiers, uh, and so forth. And then, to bring us up to the present, the time is in the middle of, two th of, the, year, of the year 2000, and all the preliminaries have been done, all the players are on board, and now it's up to the World Bank to vote yes or no to proceed with this project. And that's where we are at today. And I'll give you another hint. I do would like to ask at some point in the next hour or so, what if the World Bank said no? Could this project go forward without the World Bank? We won't discuss it now. But the presumption is in the case that you need the World Bank. You can't do this deal without the World Bank. Maybe that presumption is correct. That's implicitly presumed in the whole case. Maybe not. And you have to think about think about that. So that's our that's where where we are today. Um, has, has anybody worked on a similar project like this? And that is to say, at, at any level, in the government or outside the government, have you ever worked on a what I would call a highly complex, capital intensive, resource extraction project? with many moving parts. Has anybody been involved in those? Just to we at, at any stage? I I I worked on the Vietnam project that is in the You didn't go anywhere. It, it, yeah, but we spent quite a lot of time working on it. I think we spent about seven years. We signed the contract. Um, what was the project? Just to very briefly describe the um, project. We were going to establish an aluminum smelter in Guha. Um, the Eastern Cape. In the Eastern Cape. Yeah, um, we had just built a port there and uh, just going to make the port viable and we had both had an industrial development zone there. And, and so we, 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 we had a, a French company coming wanting to, to develop the, the smelter and in the middle of it they were taken over by a Canadian company and um, towards the end, we, we started again with a Canadian company. Towards the end, the Canadian company was taken over by an Australian company. 
and then towards the end, after we had signed the contract, as from how many did, years? Um, about five, six years, uh, uh, six, seven years, as from being at the capacity to supply the project. So, Tramelo's story <laughs> on one level is unique. Every one of these deals is unique. And every one, but think of that five years working on a project, and it went nowhere. It went nowhere. And this is not unusual. There's always a reason or a series of reasons, but when you're dealing with something so big, so complicated, there's so many ways it can break down before you get to go. So it, these are, this is just a very, very complicated uh, business when you get into the, what are really multi-billion dollar uh, projects. And, and that's why I wanted to put this timeline on the board, just to show you this was a long, from the early 1970s, 30 years. 30 years. And they're just at this, possibly at the go star stage. And so you can see that when you're talking about these types of projects, they are very large, they are very, very complicated. I also like to know, and this I think there might be more hands in the air, has anybody had the pleasure, or otherwise, of working closely with the World Bank, or the World Bank financing of any kind, where you've interacted on a, put your hand down. Put your hand down. He's the, he's the enemy. Uh, has anybody had to negotiate with, or collaborate with, been, I don't, I'm not going to let you get started here because I know, I know what, what, what might come about that. But anybody else? Okay, Leonard, what, what, tell us just a little bit about your experience, briefly about your experience with the World Bank. What was it, what, in what capacity? Uh, this is one of the very small projects, $5 million worth of projects, uh, short term high impact, that was designed rather quickly uh, between the government of Rwanda and the World Bank. Hard assets. No, no. It's all technical assistance. Technical so technical assistance, assistance is basically paying people to do stuff. Precisely. Okay. And it's been a pretty satisfactory experience. So far, it's been one year down the road, and uh, the meetup review is scheduled sometime soon. Uh, I would say, uh, that's what I'm saying, it's a short term, high impact project, not really complex compared to this one or what it was just. Okay. Right. So let's. Good. So we'll come back to your experience with it. Let's just talk now about the specifics of this case. And at the beginning of the case, we, are, we the readers, are told uh, that this is a unique opportunity, quote unquote, this Chad Cameron pipeline project, this $4.7 billion is a unique opportunity to alleviate poverty in one of the poorest countries in the world. It would allegedly the base case can be believed. When it's completed, uh, it's going to increase the revenues of the Chad government by more than 50 percent. So it's very, very significant. And so if it's successful, it certainly would be unique in that it would be such an extraordinary uh, contributor uh, to the budget, uh, the revenue of the country. Uh, and the case also claims at the outset before we get into the details, that not only is it unique because of its potential for poverty alleviation, but also it attracts an extraordinary amount of private sector resources. Money, expertise, hard assets that are scarce or non-existent in this particular country. So it could be a poster child for direct foreign investment that would alleviate poverty, be profitable for the government, and oh, by the way, profitable for the private sector participants, presumably uh, also. So it comes off as being an extraordinarily attractive project, at least at the beginning, uh, when we first start talking about the case. And of course, all this may be true, that it's unique, that it's going to do all the things it says it's going to be. But uh, it's also true that by any measure, by any standard, uh, Implementing a $4.7 billion, not just the investment cost, project uh, in a country uh, as poor and undeveloped as Chad uh, is extremely high risk on many, many different levels, which we, we have to discuss. Uh, any capital intensive project of this type is going to be high risk for a lot of reasons. But here we have an investment of that magnitude. Uh, in a country with a long, long history, as the case tells you, to 
put it mildly, a civil unrest, of egregious violations of human rights, environmental degradation, uh, of poverty, uh, with no institutional capacity that we could really boast about in the government or in the private sector. Uh, this really qualifies as the poorest of the poor in terms of countries. Uh, and that is on top of the fact uh, that if this was being done in a highly developed country, we would consider this given what's involved high risk and very, very complex. So we have to, to look into it. And so the question is, knowing this and knowing what you've learned in the, in the case, um, if you were a director of the World Bank, would you say that the potential benefits based on the analysis that's been done outweigh the potential risks? some of which we know, some of which we don't know. Uh, and so we really want to see um, how you might vote on this, given that background. We want to get into the details of this, but as I revealed this morning, I have a personal great curiosity. So I would like to know what your views are on this before we discuss it. So I'm going to ask you to vote as a World Bank director, just to promote it, by the way. Now we're all directors at the World Bank, congratulations, for better or worse. And you are being asked to vote on the project as described in this, in this case. You know as much about the project as I do. And you are a director and you have to vote one of two ways, yes or no. You cannot abstain. You have to take a stand on whether you think the potential benefits of this $4.7 billion project are worth the risks, which we're going to discuss in a few minutes. Personal curiosity, how many of you World Bank directors would vote in favor of this project? Up or down? No, 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 none of this stuff. Up or down? Up, 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 up. Can you repeat the question? <laughs> You are a World Bank director who has to vote yes or no for this project. Yes. Okay. Yes? Are you voting yes? No, no, no. I'm listening. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm asking you. My hand, my hand is not up. <laughs> okay, so, so, so you're voting. So who would vote no? She wants the question right. Yeah. Are you voting yes or no? She wants you to repeat the question. The question is whether to vote for the project or go for it at the World Bank. The World Bank has to approve the project or say, no, we're not going to participate. Okay. It isn't to say, as I, as I suggested at the beginning, that the project might not go forward without the World Bank. But right now, you are in the role of a World Bank director who has to approve or reject the project. You with me? How many voted yes? Just one more time. <laughs> okay. Can you vote yes? How many say no? How many no? One, two, three. You're abstaining. That's bad. <laughs> no, no. Okay, we got some no's. Okay. Very, very good. So we know exactly where you stand. Who are the stakeholders? Let's just talk very, very quickly. Who has a stake in this? This gets a little bit more complicated, doesn't it, than the one we did this morning? Just very quickly, we want to list who has a stake in the outcome of this project. It's my stake. Say again. The government. Governments. And in this case, we have two.
to other countries in Africa that they can do something similar. Fair enough. It's a good point. Any? Okay, so who else? Companies. Oil companies. And we know that there are multiple. So these are very large, as you know, uh, but very large multinational uh, oil companies, all from the mainly from the West, exclusively from the West, not just from the US, but all over the West, that explore, produce, uh, and, and distribute uh, oil. Uh, and these are the biggest, these are the giants. Um, what else? The Chadian financial sector. The Ch Chadian financial sector. Now, why are we saying that, Richard? I, w I, wanted to do, I wanted to do this quickly, but you're making it complicated. Um, I'm saying that because um, according to the revenue management plan, uh, yeah, you know, you know the rest. So, so some, of that, <laughs> some of that money would be used to, um, would be channeled towards development projects. And I doubt whether the, the banks had experience in, in handling that sort of okay. money. Once again, we, when we talk about governments, we see that their governments are not monolithic. There are many parts of the governments with different interests. But you're right, it's a good point. What else? Somebody already said it. The, the World Bank and the IFC. Environmental interest groups. Say again? Environmental. 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 environmental groups. Why don't we just say environmental groups and other uh, other NGOs who have social Indigenous people of, uh, is it Cameroon? Yeah. Say again. Indigenous people. Since I'm not sure we're going to get back to this, yeah. why, why, why is this important? Why are they stakeholders in this particular project? I mean, the indigenous people, I think it's fair to say, are always important, right? But why is it an issue in this particular from what I gathered from the paper is that uh, in terms of the environmental impact assessment, it was found out that there are some people somewhere who rely on hunting and uh, if the pipeline has to be built in that area, it might impact on their livelihood. Yes, that's very good. So basically when you're doing a large natural resource projects, particularly when they involve uh, massive extraction, there is going to be some environmental impact. You can control it, you can mitigate the risks, you can do lots of things. But usually, or often, it is in areas where a lot of people live. Uh, and their lives are definitely going to be disrupted. And, and this may be bad, this may be good, there are maybe ways to mitigate some of the disruption or not. But certainly, you wouldn't want to be going forward with a project like this without taking those interests into consideration. Uh, I'm not sure about this, but could you also see the rebels as well as taking this? The rebels? <laughs> if it's not financed by the World Bank, would you think the interest gained financed by Libya and other countries? Okay, I, I don't know enough about Chad to know that, but you're saying that there are other alternative financing mechanisms, so they may want to, are you suggesting they may want to undermine this project so that they can get a, a piece? I'm happy, I don't know enough, and it isn't mentioned in the case, but it's an interesting thought. <coughs> Chad has been on and off in civil war and had a civil war going on um, for decades. Uh, and just to round out that discussion, the president of Chad, um, was he elected? <laughs> no. Uh, he has been in power as a result of a coup d'etat. 
Uh, at one point, he is referred to as a warlord. Um, and so this country is, has just constant unrest and political instability over a long, long period of time. So this is such a rich uh, resource that we can assume that there are lots of people that have interest in the African of this project. But this, I think, did we miss anybody major? Any particular? <laughs> I think politicians are also key stakeholders here, especially the opposition politicians. Opposition to the president. I thought there was no opposition to the president. <laughs> but okay. Uh, Ryan? Yeah. What about the 90% of the population of Chad that are desperately poor? Are they stakeholders? Well, that's the indigenous population. No, it's not. No, it's not. But what was meant by the indigenous population were marginalized groups within a poor country. It's not the same thing. Well, it's kind of these projects. Yeah, but I mean, it's the story as well. Uh, if the project is successful, if the government generates $50 million in uh, 50% of its revenue from this project, if it allocates those, those revenues correctly, as, the, as, as described in the project, uh, the, the beneficiaries are going to be a change, I mean, people, of course. Uh, there's no question about that. So before we get into the crazy, I just want to go give you a 90-second tutorial on finance. We're not going to go through the finance of this project. We'll be here all day. But first, and if you want to look at the financing of this project, which is really kind of interesting and not that complicated, you go to the exhibit. 3B on page 14, and I'm not going to go through the numbers, but I do think it's important to understand how these types of projects are generally financed. What does the term project finance mean? Say What is the term? The project finance is, it has a very specific meaning in the, in the lexicon of finance. What does that mean? Money for the project. Say it again. Money to implement the project. Not quite. What if I put the term non-recourse? I know this is a little bit technical, but I think you should know this. Non-recourse project. What does that mean? Well, basically, when we talk about project finance, we mean that, that it is the revenue from that particular project that is discrete. And the revenue from that project is used to pay back the, 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 the lenders uh, and everyone else. And if you do not have recourse as a lender, for example, to the parent company. So let's just say this was, rather than a consortium of oil companies, let's assume just Exxon. Just one, one company. And Exxon has projects all over the world. It's a multi-gazillion dollar country, company, and it decides to finance or be a major lender to this project as well as an owner. When we talk about non-recourse financing, what we're saying is that if this project fails, Exxon will lose the money that it invested in this project, but you have no recourse to any other asset of Exxon. And with project finance, which is what basically the IFC does, almost the IFC is a perfect example of project finance here. Every time it finances a project with debt and or equity, with or without other people, it's a project finance deal because it's the revenues from that specific project, that company, that are generated that will or will not pay back the, the debt, the, the lenders, and the equity holders. So it's a discrete financing package. And you have no recourse, generally speaking, back to the parent. And so it becomes very, very dependent on the revenues that are generated from that specific project. And so this project, without going through the numbers, was, was, base, was, was plain to know. We had some debt, and we had some equity, and all the, the numbers changed. Uh, you, it, part of the debt came from the, the capital markets, which means that uh, for this project, there were bonds that were issued. That's a form of debt. 
Uh, and IFC uh, was a lender to the project. I want to come back to IFC in a second. And that was the IFC A loan. And then there was an IFC B loan. The B loan was an IFC in addition to putting its own resources in to the project as a lender was a syndicator. It created a syndicate to attract additional money to the project from other banks. So it syndicated a second loan that it didn't directly participate in, but it was the syndicator of that loan. One of the roles that IFC can play in attracting additional capital to a project from the private sector. Export credit agencies, government bilateral export credit agencies also were lending money. And then you have your equity. And the equity was primarily from the consortium of oil companies that were involved. Uh, and although they didn't put directly equity in, they were in effect equity holders. The governments in Chad and Cameroon were in effect equity holders. Although they weren't a source of finance, they were going to get dividends and revenues from it. So you would you know, consider them to be equity holders as well. And in one form or another, uh, this kind of a structure exists in a lot of large capital intensive, expensive projects. Why do you, Excel, I just said, is, is one of the biggest, it's the biggest company in the world, by the way, in terms of, of, of CapEx. It, it goes up and down because some days Apple is, some days, some days Microsoft is, some days Exxon is. It depends on the price of the stock. But it is one of the two or three largest companies in the world. They could have done this in a heartbeat with their own money. Why did they create a consortium? Why does anyone ever create a consortium? Risk mitigation. Period. It's not risk, it's to spread the risk. That's why you have a syndicate of banks to lend. It's, it's to spread the risk across more players. It becomes, on the one hand, more complicated because you've got to get along with these people, and you have to have agreements on how you're going to split the profits and so forth. But in a, in a country like Chad, without, we, don't want to, we don't want to be too critical of our friends in Chad, but in a country like Chad, where we've already established it's more or less high risk, we want to spread the risk, and that would be one of the reasons why uh, there would be a consortium. Secondly, just to be clear, since not many of you have worked directly with the World Bank, what is the difference between the World Bank and the IFC? IFC, by the way, is, is part of the World Bank. It's like a wholly owned subsidiary of the World Bank. But it has its own staff, its own budget, does its own stuff. They're, they're really distinctly different missions. What is the difference? Dorian, do you know? Um, I believe the IFC is. Wait, listen. The IFC primarily focuses on private sector development, so the uh, investment, they work mostly in investments of large projects like dams, roads, that kind of stuff. Well, um, the World Bank is more poverty alleviation through development projects. Uh, they have a wing that does grants and large loans to governments. Okay, you're, you're almost right. Does anybody want to be a little bit more precise? Go ahead. I was also going to say that they, they focus more on poverty alleviation and growing economies. I mean, they, they're, they're funding money to try and, and help out how we can develop up economies and how we can reduce poverty. In, in well, both of them would claim they are po they're reducing poverty. Yeah, but we in the world bank. And sit in You're an IFC fellow. <laughs> Both say they're economic, they're the development yeah. institutions that are interested in economic development, but they have very different strategies for achieving those objectives. The ISC is more. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, what were you going to say? Yeah, yeah. ISC is the investment uh, wing of the World Bank. They, they focus in the, they're like businesses, part of the World Bank, that invest money for each other. Well, I'm going to be a little bit more specific. You're, you're all right, but you're, none of you are completely right. 
We have to get very precise about this, because I'm sure before your careers are over, we're all going to have the pleasure or the displeasure of working with the world like the IFC. I think everybody is right, but in my opinion, IFC focuses on, on the private sector and um, particularly improving the, the business environment. Whereas the World Bank, um, its focus is on public sector investments. And um, the only difference here is um, from what Doreen said, I think that is where the World Bank focuses on dams, infrastructure, that, that kind of thing. Okay, you're getting, you're getting very close. Let's get, but let's get legal or juridical here. Uh, by statute, by our, uh, the world, the IFC cannot lend to a government. It can only lend to a private enterprise. The World Bank, on the other hand, by statute, can only lend to a government. This term, non-recourse, which I spelled wrong, nobody told me, uh, is very, very important. When the IFC lends to a private enterprise, it has no recourse, including to the government of that country. So if IFC makes an investment in a company, it's a non-recourse loan or a non-recourse investment, and if it fails, they can't turn to the government and say, pay up, make good on the loan. They are at risk like any other private investor with that private enterprise. Just to round it out, they are always a minority financier. They will only invest in a project, a private company in a developing country when other money is involved, and they usually insist that more than 50% of the ownership, but not always, is local. So they're trying, as Richard said and a couple other people said, they're trying to develop the private sector. Their mission in life is private sector development by providing debt, loans, and equity equity and technical assistance. But their mission is to develop the private sector. We would say poverty alleviation, economic growth and development, just like those folks at the World Bank, okay? The World Bank, on the other hand, uh, is uh, only lends to government, and it does not, by definition, if your client is the government, which legally it must be, there's no equity involved, right? So it's just a lender. There's no, there's no way. Just to anecdotally tell you what's happened over the last 20, 25 years, when I was in the IFC, a long, long, long time ago, you gotta go to the bio, uh, this was the 1980s, we had between, when I was there, between three and 400 people. And we lent our disbursements annually I don't remember the exact thing, but it was about a 12th or a 14th, the disbursements of the World Bank. If I walked down the street in Washington, D.C. and said I worked at the IFC, nobody would know what I was talking about. It was a nothing organization. It was where the private sector was just beginning to be a factor in development. And the IFC, as the development finance institution doing private sector development, was just beginning to be recognized as being relevant. Fast forward to 2012, there are over 4,000 people at the IFC. Uh, it's now about half the size of the World Bank in terms of staff. I'm leaving a little bit off on that. But I think, what, what did the World Bank disperse last year, about 12 billion? I think it's about, it's about a, between a, IFC is about a third to a half the disbursements annually as the World Bank. It's grown exponentially in importance. It's not to say that the World Bank isn't still very important. It's sort of emblematic of what's happened in the world of development where the role of the private sector and the importance of private sector development has just grown, it's exploded. And the IFC is just one small example of how this issue of private sector development has taken on such an extraordinarily large role relative to where it was uh, in the early 80s. Uh, and so now it's, it's, it's rivaling the World Bank in terms of what it does in many different ways. And the other thing that's happened is they have begun to merge some of their activities. They do technical assistance activities together now. And they're trying to develop more of a one institution um, a culture with varying degrees of success. Uh, but that, that is the idea. And I will allow my colleague Brian Levy, former, you're a former 
former staff member. Former staff member. But much more recent than me. Do you have anything to add? Well, I mean, the only thing I want to put a market on for later, I was part of the Africa Regional Management Team in 2000 when this decision was made. So I was at some of that process, and I had staff subsequently who worked on it. So run the story, and then I'll come in low enough. Keep my gut powder dry. What, 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 what Brian is, going to, is saying is he's going to be very sensitive. <laughs> <laughs> very sensitive to what we say here. But I didn't not, tell you how I voted. But we're not going to be deterred by <laughs> Brian's hypersensitivity to what we say about it. Okay? But uh, he, was, he, was, he was there when this was all uh, happening. So I said at the beginning this is a very risky undertaking. Just briefly. What risks are we talking about specifically? Just in cat what categories of risk are involved in the financing of a project like this? How, how did you, you're talking to your, your boss and you're coming about this project? I think there's a lot of political risk. Um, given that Chad is unstable, um, anything can, can happen. Uh, as an investor, you are looking at uh, stability in terms of the political framework. So when we talk about levels of risk, and anybody that is in the business of, 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 of financing talks a lot about risk. You know, a financier, basically, the, their job description is to assess risk. That's what they do, because you're, you're making a commitment, a financial commitment, today for some payoff in the future. It could be tomorrow, it could be a month, a year, 30 years. But you're always talking about the future. And there's only one thing we know with absolute certainty about the future, and that's that it's uncertain. And therefore, we're dealing with risk. And so on one level, we're talking about political risk, especially, again, given the countries involved. Political risk, very difficult to assess. Very difficult to assess, but it's certainly there. Any, what are the other risks? Think like a business person. Uh, you're talking about, you're thinking like an NGO person. Huh? I would think about think about it in terms of a person who may be putting money on the line. I mean, the risk is real. What you're talking about. There's a risk of diversion of the proceeds of the project. Say, say, I didn't hear. Risk of diversion of the um, funds that would be the proceeds from the project. Are you saying the risk that the revenue generated is going to be enough? No, that's it's not. It's going to be diverted. Huh? Diverted. Diverted. Okay. 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 So, let's so call that corruption. Let's just give that a, a, a simple word of corruption. <laughs> <laughs> Which is not too far removed from this, but we'll, we'll make that distinction. Again, I want you to think as a, as, a, as a financier, someone who is about to commit resources, real resources, to something that you hope is going to pay off big time in the future, but has some Come on, Richard. I think there could be a revenue risk. Revenue risk. Well, let's, let's talk about revenue risk. What are the stages of a, pro of a project like this? They're, they're, they're basically two stages, if you want to simplify it. One is, is the, is the pre-operating measure. And that is basically, is it ever going to get built? Construction. And with a big project like this, it's years. It's a lot of money, but it's also years. So we talk about risk in terms of, we have a, law, we have a, we have a large risk before revenue. And then we have operators. And that is, are we going to generate the revenue that we say we are? Number one. And number two, is the revenue that we generate going to go be allocated the way we say it will be? Whether or not it is going to the right people? Uh, and is it going to be distributed in the right way? Any other risks? 
Uh, yes, I think about one, and I would say reputational risks because you know if you're the World Bank, you worry about OIFC, you worry about your, your, your reputation. So few are investing in a in a venture like this, and it blows up or something adversely happens to the some of the indigenous communities. You know, you could be you could take years to to, to reverse that. You really think so? Yeah. Roger, in this particular case, what kept the World Bank up at night on losing this decision was only reputation. You know, from the World Bank, well, they said they didn't have any at the end of the day. They were, they were like, no, <laughs> well, that's another issue. They would have, you know, what did we have to lose is another story. But that, but that was the central story. It's a reputational risk. I, I'm a little cynical, but I, I'll give you the benefit of the I don't know if it is. Mentioned, but I want to say there is a, a risk of not even getting the resource itself. You're not getting what? The resource, the, the oil itself. Yeah, the oil. I mean, the oil has to be has to be uh, has to be. They have to, the reserves have to be proven. They got to be pumped out of the ground. That's all part of the operation operating risk. But it's very very important. Are they going to have enough oil? And so forth. And not just a map, the comments on the quantity. Quality the oil. So there are lots of technical risks involved. Anything else? No, I was going to say the oil price, but I think it's covered by the operating system. Okay. Yeah. Well, there, there, there are various sub levels of this risk. Uh, it is a very, and again, going back to what we said at the beginning, it's very, very complicated and all the way along. How many years is this project? From start to finish? Well, that's to get it started. And then what? 2032, it's got a 20-year life. Have you factored in the... Um, I have not. So there are... The pipeline... With the uh, transnational issues. Yeah. I don't know if they're best friends or not, but across, across border issues. Chad, there's a war risk, literally, because this country has been uh, at war in effect for so, for so long. So we could, we could go on and on and on about this. Just want to add one more risk. That is the foreign exchange uh, risk, Forex. In terms of the currency. Foreign, foreign currency risk. Yes. That's a very, very interesting point. But why is it not a risk? Why is it not a risk? Because the financing is coming from the oil companies that we are and, and, and the revenue? What happens to the, to, to the output? Also, it will be sold abroad, so there will be no... It's, it's dollar financing and yeah. it's almost all dollar revenue. Yeah. So you are, you're not eliminating because there's some local cost, but for the most part, uh, you don't have a lot of foreign exchange risk. Would it be, you'd have a lot of foreign exchange risk if you had dollar financing and local sales. Uh, but in this particular case, it's pretty much mitigated. Not completely, uh, but pretty much. So, let's talk about Brian's favorite institution, the World Bank. What, 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 what is their role? What is the World Bank? What, what, what do they do? What are the very, and they have multiple they're the preeminent development finance institution in the world by most standards in terms of their size, in terms of their, 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 their geographic reach, in terms of their age, they've been a long time around for more than 60 years. Uh, what is, what, how would you describe what they do? It's called the World Bank. What do they do? Audacity to say that we, not she, 
we didn't spend time in the world. Like, why was that? That's not the question I asked, but I'm kind of curious to be anywhere. Well, in the projects that I worked alongside, there was um, questions around, you know, how the World Bank, I guess, implemented projects. So, I mean, they financed them, but they also had project management um, uh, capacity, and, and so the way that those were implemented weren't always um, Okay, so you're answering my question indirectly by making a value judgment, but I'm going to talk about the, the functions of the World Bank. So, so you said that they're a financier, they're, they're a bank. They financial resources in the form of very low-cost loans. Some of them are subsidized, some of them are not. But because in the capital markets, the World Bank gets its money, should anyone ask you, they raise money just like anybody else, any government, any corporation. They go out into the marketplace, into the international capital markets, and they, and they issue bonds and other financial instruments. Uh, and so they raise their money like any other institution. They have no professional treatment, except that they are perceived by investors all over the world in the international capital markets as being almost, maybe not quite, but almost like the most AAA government which means that their borrowing costs are very, very low. So it's not a subsidy, but they, standing behind the World Bank are go implicit government guarantees because the governments own the World Bank. And so with that privilege of being effectively owned by the World Bank, they can go out and borrow at the same, just a few hundreds of a basis points more than, for example, the U.S. government. Why the U.S. government is considered a AAA credit, and it's not anymore. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. It doesn't deserve it. But anyway, so the World Bank is a privileged borrower in the international financial markets. They borrow very, very low. They make a spread, a very narrow spread. They lend it low cost to their borrowers who are, as we said before, governments. They lend directly to governments and the government must guarantee the repayment of that loan, the government they're lending to. So they always take this government guarantee. So they're, they're perceived rightly or wrongly by the international financial community as an extremely safe bet. And so they borrow at very, very low rates for interest. So that's, what you think about the World Bank, you think of them as a financier. What else, what else do they do? You may. Well, we know that the World Bank is supposed to be there to alleviate poverty. So the projects that they deal with are supposed to be uh, achieving the end result of alleviating poverty and growing economies. But I think that they also that's their have... Mission. That's their mission. And I'm asking what they do. Okay. <laughs> but I think what they do is have very specific uh, agendas around where and how they will lend money. So I think that they have uh, an idea of what they want to achieve out of a project and what the end results will be before they get involved with the project. I don't think it's something that they just do because they're trying to be nice or because they think no, they have the money to lend. But you're, I, I, I want to make a distinction between the, th the stuff they do and, and, you know, and what their roles are. They're very specific roles. And one of their specific roles, they do promote economic development in various different ways, but they do that through various Well, they bring in other roles. So they, they let, attract. Let me, let me go on. So what is the money? What else? Well, I'm taking kind of Technical assistance. I was looking for that word. So, and you sort of said uh, so much, but it's, uh, you call it project management. Uh, but they, so this presumes, by the way, when we use the word technical assistance, the presumption is that they're experts. They have expertise, and that would be scarce expertise in the, under these, under these uh, circumstances. And in fact, whether you like the World Bank, as I do, or you don't, as Solange feels, um, you have to acknowledge that there is a lot of, there's a deep reservoir of technical expertise in the bank, in many, many different sectors. Uh, and some of it's better, than, some of it's good, some of it's bad, some other people may be better or worse, but overall, you have to acknowledge whether you're a critic of the World Bank or not, that it is an extraordinary resource for technical assistance in everything from agriculture to project finance, uh, to health, to environment, lots of different areas. 
say that these people are really, really good at what they do on a technical assistance basis. So that's another thing they do. What else do they do? Well, through the through Liga, they also provide insurance against political risks. Okay, insurance. Only, not, let's be very clear, against political risk, not commercial risk. So if this project, if, I don't know, was me involved in this project? Did it say? I don't remember if it said or not. Uh, but if, me, if this project broke down because they didn't find enough oil or because there was an operational breakdown, MECA insurance would do them no good. If there was a civil war in Chad and it, would, and it led to the uh, cessation of operations, they would collect the insurance. But there's, a, there's something else that's really important that's not maybe quite as explicit that is very important in this particular project. What is the other role that the World Bank plays? Let me give another try. I think in this project, there were some of the big brother who uh, were supposed to hold the hands of the government and make sure that they're walking in line. It's sort of the, uh, you know, the, the Well, big brother and holding the hand. <laughs> <laughs> project that is so fraught with risk here, they are a watchdog, and they are going to monitor performance of the oil companies, of the government, in a lot of different ways which we can discuss, but this is an important role, and you might call that that they play the role of honest broker. I'm not sure. So why don't you agree with this? Broker, the old word used to be imposed conditions. I think we might as well. <laughs> I do, I do, I do, I do. What else? So they're, they, they, are, they monitor, and they monitor, and they all, and, they, and these are not exactly the same, being a watchdog or a monitor and an honest broker. And we've heard from Anita and from others that there are tremendous environmental risks. There are risks of uh, all the indigenous people being displaced or, or being the big losers here. So there are a number of different types of risks where they are looked upon as ensuring that depending on how you care to define it and who you are, what your stakes are, that, this, that, that the stakeholders are treated fairly. Very vague term, very open to interpretation. But somebody has to be play that role. Uh, and the World Bank sees itself, I think, as playing that role, for better or worse. Uh, and so, sometimes they're being the policeman, sometimes they're being the honest broker, sometimes they're being the arbiter of fairness, but because of their role, they're considered to be an important participant in this. Now, this is very generally what the World Bank does, and let me go back to the question I asked very early on, which was, um, what if the World Bank wasn't in this project? Could it have gone forward? No. Who said no? I said no. Question again. No. So your question again. My question again is could this project have proceeded without the participation of the World Bank? Yes. Yes. Okay. I, I think, you know, so their financial role was probably Helpful but not essential. Yes. Helpful but not essential. I think you could have gotten the money without the bank. But without the money and their participation, you wouldn't have gotten these other things. And I think most people would say who are interested in development, maybe not the president of Chad, but that having this playing these roles and the technical assistance role is pretty important. I would say that Exxon probably said they didn't need their technical assistance. But probably the Chad and Cameroon governments needed um, whether they recognize it or not. So they play a very, very 
important intangible and tangible role in addition to their money, is my point. And so we don't think of the World Bank as just being a financier, although we think of them um, primarily in that context because they're called uh, a bank. But the, all these other roles they play are very, very important. Um, and they're also going to be very, very important, by the way, we talked about the environment, about the indigenous people, in, in terms of building capacity in the government. Something we talked about, Ryan talked about it, Jan talked about it, that we're trying to build capacity in these other depending on how you care to define that. And the World Bank uh, is supposed to be playing a very, very important role in capacity building. And when you have a project that's this large, so this dominant, this capacity building role can be very, very uh, important uh, in, 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 in the success of the project. In, in principle, in, in, in still do we know the World Bank? Say again? In principle, Chad can still go ahead without the World Bank. Yeah, I think it could go ahead. Okay, so we agree. We agree. Okay. But I, 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 the question is, it could go ahead financially. Would either it, way. It, your, you, the argument could be made that either way we may need the World Bank. I, I won't argue with you because we can't resolve that issue, but certainly there's an argument to be made that given the technical assist, the technical capability of these huge companies who've done this all over the world successfully, and the ability to raise capital in the international financial markets, you could make the case. But you would be taking a lot of risks, additionally, that would be hard to have a lot of confidence in these guys, such as the environmental risks, such as the protection of indigenous peoples, plus <coughs> as, uh, 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 such as poverty alleviation, all these other ancillary benefits that we hope to get from this project would arguably be more at risk if the World Bank is not involved. But we could we could debate this for a long time, and you may you know it's hard for you to never have an answer. You don't think so? Yeah, well, I'm thinking of one particular example of striking a deal with a country which has wealth of experience on these things. And you sit go into a government and government to government agreement. And, and you are well, this wouldn't be government to government, this would be government to private sector. No, no, I mean I mean if they don't go this route, another option would be the government to government agreement with a country. But anybody disagree? Does anybody feel that the World Bank is absolutely imperative to the success of this? project, not just profitability, but the multi-dimensional objectives we're trying to achieve with this project. William, are you going to disagree with your friend and colleague? <laughs> your neighbor? <laughs> One of your best friends? Yes. Oh, my friend. It's <laughs> heartbroken. <laughs> okay, uh, so, you know, I think if this was like drilling offshore, you probably need a water bank. But as long as we're laying those pipes in those communities with indigenous people, and you were dealing with government uh, that, you know, at best were very risky, I think just having a word bank added one more layer of comfort for the the, type, the likes of Exxon and, and Chevron. So you think that the, you think the private sector wants the World Bank there? I really think on this one project, the private sector really, really wanted the World Bank there. Because you know they they, they there's so many things that were at stake that they that they probably would have trusted the World Bank to handle more than, than they would have. So just to be clear cut, he went a step further than me. Yeah. He's, 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 he's saying not only that the, that the World Bank that the private sector needs and wants the World Bank. I don't know the answer to this question. I just want to give a perspective on, um, I hadn't thought about the watchdog on a spoken fairness when I was reading this, but uh, when you brought it out, I thought about a project in Kenya, 3,000 3, megawatts wind project, um, where we brought home the World Bank and were pretty annoyed when they said no to the project. But when you think about it, the cost, um, because it's out into Kana, Kana is in the north, 
And uh, the cost of taking the um, distribution framework to, 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 to Rukana is very high, meaning that the, 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 the people would have to pay more for the, for the investor to get uh, the money that they've put in. And therefore, the World Bank said that was not a viable project. And now, for me, the clarity in terms of fairness, uh, honest broker, comes out in making that decision for the Turkana Week project. Okay, Simon, you can give us another perspective. Yeah, what I want to relate to the chat situation is what happened in, in Sudan, the, the, the former Sudan. The former Sudan. Yeah, the, the oil field ran a pipeline for 1,800 kilometers to the Red Sea. That is from South Sudan. And that was done by the twice, twice as long, for everyone's information, as the pipeline we're talking about in this project. Yeah. Now, the, that was done by the Chinese. Then when the government of South Sudan decided to shut down the taps of the oil, because it was, it was through financing, now the, the financier could not get the money because the money was to come from the proceeds of the oil running through the pipeline to the Red Sea. Classic project finance. Yes, so the, the, the Chinese government plus the financiers, plus the, co the, the companies running the pipeline, all of them came to South Sudan to negotiate with the government of South Sudan to be able to allow the oil to flow so that they can get back their money, you know. So it became very risky for them because there were, there, there were no insurance. There was no somebody there to be able to provide finances. That is why Exxon, Pet, Petronas and Chevron will have to do, we have to work with the, the World Bank in this project. Otherwise, they cannot. Because should, should, should anything happen, where are they going to, to go there? It's, it's absolutely true that the World Bank provides a level of comfort all the way along the value chain that would not be there. They're a preferred lender, and governments do not like to get into conflict with the World Bank. It is, it's a preferred lender. It's also the lender of last resort. I mean, most of these countries cannot borrow and get access to capital without the World Bank. It is, it is the, sometimes, certainly with the Chad, it's their only source. And so that fact alone, you know, you do not want to antagonize the World Bank. You can possibly avoid it. And so it gives a level of comfort to have them involved. And that's a very interesting example. Because without the World Bank involved, these, they didn't have much leverage. Okay, as I said at the beginning, we could, we could really go all afternoon on this case, but we can't. So I, I just want to say, who would like to make the case that this project should be? Who, who raised their hand and said they were voting for it? Almost everybody. So if you don't like the World Bank so much, you're going to vote for this project. Uh, yeah, I, that's Where is it? Okay, so what are you going to say? What are you going to say? The country to provide resources. Um, for health, education, social development potentially, so those are good things. And but yeah, as I say, 55-45. I think you know what can what can go wrong. Um, there's quite a lot, and so I'm really curious before the break um, to know what actually happened. That will take another hour. And a half. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I, I will tell you a little bit. But we're we're talking about Solange is saying to vote for this project. Although she's a little, she, and no one would vote for this project with great enthusiasm because there are obviously, we just scratch the surface, huge risks, even if it wasn't checked. But what is the mandate, the mission of the World Bank? Poverty alleviation, economic development, technical assistance. Attracting additional resources from the public and the private sector. Developing natural resources. I mean, if you look at it in that context, it's a no-brainer. This is exactly what the World Bank was put on this planet to do. I mean, there's a what? There's a what? Are you a however? <laughs> having an oil industry does not necessarily mean that you have economic development. Um, and, and uh, so we have a word here that I want to get on the board before we get too much further, and then I'm going to let you wax eloquent on this. 
But the word I, I, I'm guessing that you're going to talk about is something that we call. I may be lost. It's a resource. Were you going to talk about the resource first? Um, no, no, I wasn't going to talk too bad. I mean, you could. I could, yeah, yeah. <laughs> It, 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 yeah, well, one problem is, of course, the resource curse. Uh, Everybody know what the resource curse is? Yeah. In, 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 and in Africa, let me just say before, I'm going to give you the floor in a second. In Africa, it has been a mega curse. If you look, and especially with oil, when we look all across this continent and we see this extraordinarily rich resource, oil, in almost every single case, uh, it has been, uh, it has been, well, to say wasted would be an understatement. Uh, Nigeria, Angola, we go down the list of all these countries that have a rich resource here, and, has, and God is coming up. And I'm not saying they're going to do the same thing, but it is really proven to be very difficult to be endowed with this extraordinarily useful resource and not to suffer from this curse in one way or another. Different countries, different to, to different extents, but it's a real problem, and we have lots of empirical evidence of this. I didn't mean to interrupt, and I certainly want you to give your. No, no, I was just going to say that I mean, having an oil industry does not necessarily ensure that or translate in, into economic development. Uh, and maybe talking about the, the, the resource, because um, I mean, or, 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 or what makes it possible is because we do not have. You do not have good governance, you know, and, and so the oil um, and the resources, what they do, they um, make sure that those who govern are not dependent on the people, uh, and so they don't need uh, the assent of, of the people in order to, to be in power. And in this particular case, we are going into it with two governments uh, that are not very good role models. Um, and, and, and although they may be agreeing to conditionalities now, once the oil wells have been dug and the oil is flowing, uh, the bank will not have any, will not have any mechanism of, of, of enforcing and ensuring that they so, abide by, yeah. So Solange is saying, if I may paraphrase, the World Bank's role is to alleviate poverty, all the things I just said. This is, this is tailor-made for the World Bank. This is exactly what the World Bank's purpose is, its mission. It, it is achieving all those things. Of course there are risks. Not, there's no certainty in life, even in Chad. But this is an enormous opportunity. Remember where we started this? A unique opportunity, the case says, to alleviate poverty, promote development, attract private sector capital and expertise, et cetera, et cetera. But you're going to vote against it. It's OK. It's OK. Nobody's going to hold it against it. I just want to make sure. You have, you have one vote, and I want to know if it's yes or no. Um, I actually would have voted yes, but I, I just want to make sure. Who's voting no? There's so many of you. OK, uh, Tom. Tom, that's right. Tom was going to vote no. I remember from the very beginning, Tom, you were going to vote no. Make the case why we should vote against the um, I'm very skeptical of the uh, benefits of
who benefit more than the, the government of China and Cameroon in the Nigeria, as we can see. But Tom, it's okay if they benefit more as long as China, I mean, they don't have to be equal benefits. I mean, so that's something more to measure. Yes, I agree. Actually, remember, the resource lies with the people of China and Cameroon. They should be the major shareholders, not Exxon, not Petronas, not Chevron. But when these deals are structured, they are structured in such a way that 80 cents of the dollar or 60 cents of the dollar goes to uh, Chevron and then the repayment of the debt to the World Bank. And when you look at what trickles down to the ordinary person, it might be 0 0.01 percent of, 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 of the dollar. So on that note, I say no. Okay, okay. We respect, we respect your opinion. Uh, Uncle just... Did you vote yes or no? No. No? Okay. And, uh, and this one goes to Miguel. <laughs> your friend. Your, your friend. My friend Miguel. <laughs> yes. uh, he, he is referring to World Bank execution just as a layer of cushion to this whole affair. And my friend will never get to say no. The real cushion is actually doesn't, which is, doesn't exist in those list of things there, is the two um, export credit agencies that are mentioned in here. That is the COFES and the US, uh, what is it? Mark. What is that other one in the US? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Those are the cushions. Not 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 the well being what? Yeah. The cushions in terms of insurance. Cushions, cushion. Uh, if you think of a pillow, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so so the point I'm trying to make here is <coughs> if you you you, you 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 go into a different model, the one that I mentioned. You can still have that cushion in the form of the same export credit agency and, and have no problem go to bed without any problem. If you look at page four of the article, the very same paragraph, the reason why these export credit agencies are being brought on board is simply because there's going to be some sweetener provided to respective countries. And we're taking here the French or France and the US. This is where the African money is going. And we are sitting here saying World well, Bank is coming to help Africa. The real people who are going to benefit are France and US in the form of equipment that are going to be used in, the, in this project. Now you get, you get the whole essence of why we don't regard this as a project for the poor people of Chad and Cameroon. So it's, it's, okay. it's all, it's all my okay. Okay. Bureaucracy. Okay. Now we're running out of time. I just want to tell you, make a couple of comments. I want to make a couple. Of, I know we could go on and on and on. I'm not allowed. I'm, 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 I'm constrained by our by our schedule, so I apologize because I would love to talk about this for another hour. But I'm not allowed. So one thing we didn't talk about was the original projection that were the, ju the financial justification and it tells you about how much the project would cost to build, how much revenue would flow to the Chad government, how much revenue would Chad flow to the Cameroon government, over what period of time, how much would flow back to the project sponsors in the private sector. And all that data was based on the original base case which I talked about at the very, very beginning. Does anybody remember? And we said that with all project finance, it all comes back to revenue generation. Everything depends on revenue generation. And that base case projects a certain amount of revenue over a certain period of time. And forget about allocation of where those revenues go, the products go. Does anybody remember? What are the drivers of revenue in a, in a project like this? This is common sense. This is not high for the answer. What, what, what drives revenue in that projection? Price. The price of oil and the amount of oil that flows to that pipeline. 
material. So they're going to make assumptions about how much oil they're going to get out of the ground and what price they're going to sell it at. Does anybody remember, before I tell you very, very briefly what happened, what the project, what the base case oil price was? I think it was 17 or 18 dollars a Before I tell you what happened, does anybody want to take a stab at what the price of oil the bar per barrel was in 2010? About 130 dollars a barrel. No? Yeah. Yeah. It's about 130 dollars a barrel. Now it goes up and down. But if you look at what happened between 2000 and 2010, or even 2012, you'll see that although it was volatile, it never went back down to 20 again. It went up, 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 up. So, in answer, or not, in a partial response to your question, this project turned out to be an absolute bonanza financially for everybody. Because the amount of revenue generated by orders of magnitude was far, 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 far greater than what that base case projection said it would be. Now that is not to say that this is a good project or a bad project or that the money was allocated to, for the right reasons or the wrong reasons. But the base case was so far off the mark that everything else about the project became somewhat distorted in both good ways and many. You might say, well, wow, that's great. Everybody made more money. No. So let me tell you very, very briefly, and Julia, I think, is going to pass out a much more detailed explanation of what happened uh, with this project. But the what happened, we're talking about 2000. I'm going to tell you what happened in 2000. But this went on for years and years and years to what happened. And I can only give you a brief uh, synopsis of that. So, those who voted in favor of the project won the day. Congratulations, Solana. You were very persuasive. The World Bank approved the project um, as described in the project. Uh, and it was said to have been an unprecedented collaborative effort between the bank and the consortium of private companies and the two governments. It was a poster job. Everybody was happy. Uh, and, and then they went to a construction phase that took three years, and believe it or not, the financing changed a little bit, but that's sort of incidental. Some dropped out, some came in, but the, the financing plan was more or less accurate, and believe it or not, they got the thing built more or less on time, on budget. Extraordinary. Extraordinary. And so they did what they, they said they were going to do. We haven't had a chance to talk about this resource uh, this revenue management plan, which is a very interesting we can do a case on the revenue management plan alone, which is to monitor everything. But it didn't work out so well, because as the revenue started to mount, not only for the companies, but for the government, it seemed that the revenue didn't quite go in the same directions um, as were anticipated. Uh, and so, uh, there was mounting criticism that the money that was being generated by the project was not being used for the purposes that were identified by the World Bank. Environmental protection, protection of indigenous people, poverty alleviation, all the things that we care dearly about. But it was going, it was rumored to be going to arms purchases uh, and other things that were not in the original project. Uh, in Chad. And so they had a review of the project. Uh, according to one World Bank source, um, this misuse of the resource of the revenue was an unfortunate mistake in the past, and we certainly hope that this sort of thing will not happen again. That's the World Bank for That was in 2001 and 2002. So we go to 2000, later in 2000. Um, when the price of the oil was started going up, everybody was saying what a great project this was because he was generating uh, so much money. Um, and then the president of Chad, because of all this additional revenue, had decided that he wanted to renegotiate the <coughs> contract so that the Chadian government would receive a much larger percentage of the revenue that was being generated by the project. 
and, and he called for a new relationship with the bank with the project sponsors. And I could go on for the next three or four years, but eventually there was a, the World Bank declared there had been a breach of contract, suspended the project, although now it was going. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and they had another set of negotiations, they had multiple sets of negotiations on the project. Um, and terms kept being renegotiated again because the price of oil kept going up. And so there was all this additional revenue to be fought over by the companies, by the government, and especially by president, the president of Chad, who was using this, uh, the revenue for reasons that were not in the original plan. Um, eventually, the World Bank suspended its involvement in the project because it was unable to renegotiate acceptable terms. Uh, the project is ongoing. Uh, oil is still being pumped, at least it was until recently. I haven't, I'm not completely up to date. So the World Bank eventually backed out of the project because there were so many violations and breaches of contract. Some of the oil companies left the consortium and came back in because of the breach of contract. Uh, why do you think they came back in? After the, after, after, after the government of Chad completely violated the original legal agreement. So some of the oil companies walked away and the next thing you knew they were back. A lot of money on it. Uh, and so this went, it was a seesaw, back and forth over multiple years, uh, and the price of oil kept going up and up and up, and so the original projections became less and less relevant. Um, and you, uh, I, the bank eventually said, I, I, I don't have the quote in front of me, but the, the bank did a, a evaluation of the project. And one of the problems with the bank evaluations of their pro projects is the bank is evaluating its own projects. All the evaluations of bank projects are done by an internal unit. Um, rarely, if ever, it's, it's my understanding, is any external evaluation done. Is that, is that a fair statement? I, I want to comment on that one. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I, I, I would like to find, here's the quote from the evaluation that was done in 2008 by the bank. Uh, over the years, Chad failed to comply with key requirements of the re revenue management plan. The bank therefore concluded that it could not continue to support the project under these circumstances. And so the bank uh, backed out. It's much, much more complicated than I'm telling you here. The bank tried very, very hard to get this, keep this project on track to accomplish the poverty alleviation, environmental protection, indigenous people's protection uh, objectives of the projects. But the more money that was generated, the harder it was for them to exert any leverage over the Chad uh, Because they were just making so much money off of this project. And so eventually they, they backed out. Uh, Julia, what are you gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna um, hand out? It's been half out. Okay. I, I would urge you to read this because it's a very interesting uh, story. Uh, again, there are no right answers here. This is a very interesting, very complicated case. We could have looked at this from the beginning. It's just on the financial grounds, um, on the development grounds. Uh, what we decided to do is to, to try and cover a lot of different bases in a very short period of time. Um, and, and you'll have to draw your own conclusions about whether or not the project the bank should ever become involved in or not. When you're thinking about that, remember that in 2000, we didn't know what the price of oil was going to be. And that's, I think, important. So, okay, we're, we're running up a little bit over our time and we started late. So thank you very much. And I hope you enjoy uh, thinking about it. It's very complicated.